Welcome to Daily Bread Drive Through. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm uh, resetting it. We're getting into some good talks, and um, that's why I am sure to set the timer because uh, we get deep in the word, and before we know it, time has just raced. Hey, big shout to Julian and Lori Barcat. Years ago, you guys gave me this to tell us die. Uh, that's what Christ said from the cross. Uh, it is it is finished, but actually what he was saying in Aramaic is tetelestai. It means paid in full. Before he gave up the ghost, he said, I've paid it all. Wow. Yo, we're forgiven. Psalm 32, verse 1. Happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. We've got forgiveness with God. So we're on this great journey and... The feedback has just been amazing. Like, hey, we're a community. We're a church. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. Everybody said for years, the church is not four walls. It's a body of believers. It's the ecclesia in the Greek, meaning the called out assembly. Hey, all we're doing right now is just being the church. And my prayer is that as much as the church has been saying for all of these years, we're not four walls, we're not four walls, we're not an organization, we're an organism, that now everyone is intentional on living that out. Here's a good question for you today. How many times have you quoted from your own mouth that the church is not four walls of a building, that it's a body of believers living in community as one? How many times have you said that? Okay. All right. Would your life right now in this COVID climate show that you really believe what you've even said before? No doubt you've mentored someone and you slipped that nugget to them. You've uh, passed it on to a new believer. Uh, you've just rehearsed it. Would your life right now show that even though the church buildings are on all types of COVID restriction, that your life shows that indeed the church is not four walls, that it's a body? Would your life say it if your mouth could not say a word? Yo, we got to walk the walk. We can't just talk the talk. Talk is cheap. Uh, the blood of Christ is rich. And man, he's done it all. So look, right now we're talking about depression and anxiety. We're realizing the scripture says a lot about it. When you study the Bible verse by verse, one thing you want to do as a student of scripture is put emphasis on the things that God puts emphasis on. The Lord puts emphasis on moments of despair, things saints go through. And then the word even comes in in 1 Peter and says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that you're going through as though some strange thing happened to you. It's deep that it says that because the minute we go through a trial, what's the first thing we start thinking? Oh man, this is a strange thing happening to me. Then we isolate because we say, no one else is probably going through this. Uh, it's just something that I'm going through. Look at how the Holy Spirit comes in and says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that you're going through. Stop thinking it's strange because it's not strange. In fact, the word even comes in and says that there's no temptation or trial that will come into your life except for what is common to all men. All of us go through the same thing. Uh, so that verse is in Peter. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that you're going through as though some strange thing happened to you. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taken you except what is common to man. Uh, but God is faithful who will give you uh, the, bear, the uh, ability to bear it and the wisdom and the insight. James 1, 5 even comes in and talks about God giving wisdom. So we're living in despairing times. So we're going to the scriptures and we're finding camaraderie with the people in the scriptures who had despairing moments, right? And then we're also following the example of those in scripture who allowed the comfort of God to come in, who allowed the peace of God to come in, who allowed the power of God to come in, who allowed the perspective of God to come in. That's what it's all about. So we're in 2 Corinthians 12 today. Um... Here's a book that I ordered. I typically will not recommend a book if I have not read it. However, if I know the author is just batting a thousand, I will recommend the book. Here's a book called Depression. Um, the subtitle is Where is God in the Struggle? Um, and the full title actually is Depression Looking Up from the Stubborn Darkness. It's by Edward Welch. Uh, Edward Welch is just solid from Westminster Seminary. Um, he is uh, just a leading 
um, Christian psychologist. He's anointed. He's gifted. Uh, I would recommend this. Amazon can get it to you in a day. Read through it. Hold it up against scripture. The Bible says, study and look at all things. Hold fast to what is good. Prove all things. Put everything to the test. We put everything up against the light of God's word. Um, I'm also dealing with a book by an Alan Redpath. I've had this one a long time and I have read it. It's called Blessings Out of Buffetings. So it's going to talk about when Paul is buffeted by Satan and gets this thorn in the flesh. He calls it Blessings Out of Buffetings by Alan Redpath. You got to have you got to have this book in your life. Blessings Out of Buffetings. Uh, it's really a study of all of Second Corinthians. Listen to yesterday's teaching. We looked at Paul, what he's going through, um, just to really see the pain of what he's enduring. Um, he is, uh, imagine someone coming to your kids, your babies, your offspring, okay? And while you will go away on a baby, on, on a business trip, someone's coming to your babies and misleading them in basically saying that you're not really who they think you are, um, that you're, when you challenge them, that you're heavy handed, you're power tripping, you're rude, um, and then all of these things. And then they come in and say that they actually have a better anointing to raise your kids. That's what's happening to Paul when he has given birth to this church in Corinth. He even tells them in Corinth, you might have a lot of different instructors. You might have a lot of different people that can give you a great sermon. He says, but as your pastor, you only have one spiritual father because I am the one who has begotten you into uh, the fellowship of the saints, into new life in Christ because he led them to Christ. So these false apostles are coming along and doing this. And we looked at this yesterday, the anguish of Paul, the pathos of Paul, as in 2 Corinthians 11, He's really unpacking and he's defending himself. But there's a difference between being defensive and defending the ministry. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, I speak as a fool. He says like five different times, I speak as a fool, pardon my boasting. But remember, there's a difference between being defensive and defending the ministry. Even when you feel you get pulled out of pocket, sometimes there is a time to defend the ministry because you're just not going to let someone paint a picture like God is not involved when you know God is in the mix. You're just not going to let that happen. But that doesn't mean you're being defensive. So there is a difference between being defensive and defending the ministry that God has given you, defending the work that God is doing through you, defending the evidence that the supernatural is at work and that you truly are wanting him to be at the helm and not yourself. You can defend the ministry and not be defensive, but you can be defensive and not be looking to defend what God is doing. You're just being defensive. We need to know the difference between both. Boom. So he lists his sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11. He lists his sufferings. Then he comes to chapter 12 and he begins by saying, hey, it is not expedient for me to glory. He's saying it's still not, I'm, I'm having to defend the ministry. I'm having to go in my brag book and pull out my resume of what God's doing in my life just to prove that truly God is at work and that these false apostles are liars. This is a painful thing to have to do. You ever get pulled into a text thread? You could be in the middle of a dinner, be at a birthday party. You just get pulled into a text thread and you're like, yo, this isn't good. <laughs> it's not good. I'm all distracted. I'm in. It's not fun when this is happening and you could really feel Paul's pain. Now he's saying, but look, I'm going to keep going even though it's not profitable, even though this isn't what anyone wants to do when they wake up in the morning. It's amazing too that the Bible gives us the struggles and the failures uh, and the weak moments and the stress stressed out moments of the saints, right? We appreciate that, right? It makes us really understand all the more when it says in James chapter five, Elijah was a man of the same passions as me and you. What it means is Elijah had the same struggles as me and you. Good days, bad days. Woke up on the wrong side of the bed, on the right side of the bed. Yet, he prayed for three and a half years and it didn't rain. Boom. What a verse to just encourage you to believe God to do the most amazing thing. Because you know what we like to do? We like to put them up on pedestals. Everyone's special. Everyone's amazing. Everyone's like a superhero. Like everyone's like from, you know, from a fictional place, Wakanda. And here we are just from like the slums or whatever. No, these are people and God wants us to know these are people just like us. That's James 5.17. I had to turn there because the verse is that good. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. The same struggles as me and you. And yet he didn't let that stop him from believing in the 
goodness of God and the grace of God, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth for three years and six months. Then verse 18, he prayed again. Still didn't let the fact that he had good days and bad days, highs and lows, stop him from believing in the grace of God. He prayed again and the Lord gave rain and the earth brought forth their fruit. I love the digressions on Daily Bread drive through That's why sometimes you got to listen to it twice because we're going to jump around. We're going to keep it moving, keep it popping. 2 Corinthians 12. Remember, Paul, he's defending the ministry. Is he leaning a little bit and getting defensive? Who knows, man? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We just get grieved when it's happening. I'm sure he looks back and it's like, man, I wish none of that happened. But God included it in Holy Writ, right? But he is dropping some nuggets. And in the middle of this venting he's doing... Yo, we have one of the most powerful chapters in all of the Bible when it comes to getting insight to why we have these struggles that we want gone and God won't take them away. Again, in this venting, we have one of the most powerful chapters on why we go through these struggles and why these things are allowed in our life, things that we feel are hindering us. Make a list right now. What is going on in your life? What personality thing? What way of thinking? What affliction? You feel like, yo, this hinders me from being used by God. Um, it restricts me. And we get insight because Paul's going to tell us that he had one too. And we get insight into why we have these kinds of things and they don't seem to go away even when we pray. Boom, let's read. So he says, 2 Corinthians 12, 1. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. For those that came late, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will now come to visions and revelations. He says, for the last handful or two handful of verses, I listed my sufferings for Christ to show that truly God is at work in me. Uh, now I'm going to move on to my visions and revelations that he gave me. He's like, I'm going to prove to my spiritual babies that these false apostles who are trying to mischaracterize me and slander me, that they are lying. I'm going to prove that the supernatural is on my life. He says, now I'm going to move on to the visions and revelations I received. And now we get one of the deepest, deepest sets of verses. Jonah, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. You got it on your phone? Mm -hmm. My man, yo, big shouts to my 14-year-old down here recording with me because wifey is on a conference call. And what's he doing? He's got his phone out. He's getting in the word. What does Daily Bread drive Through do for you, man? A lot. That's my dude. That's my dude. That's my heart, man. That's my, come on. Yo, it's a family thing here. I hope that you're pulling the family in for yours as well. All right, let's keep it moving. Paul says this. I'm going to just read it first. I, he says, one, I'm going to move on to visions and revelations now. Then he says this, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Underline the third heaven. You see, the first heavens is where you fly in an airplane. And you care about the clouds and what kind of clouds and we're going through a cloud and, you know, jet stream, this and that, right? The second heavens is where the planets and the stars are. The third heavens is paradise. It's where God's throne is. It's where you can't go in a rocket ship. He says, I went to the third. He says, a man I knew. Notice he said that in verse two. I knew a man about 14 years ago. He went to heaven. Look at this. I knew such a man. And he says again, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. God knows how he was caught up into paradise. First, he called it the third heavens. Then he calls it paradise. And he says, and he heard unspeakable words, which it's not lawful for a man to utter. He said, this man went to paradise and heard things too sacred to reveal. Whoa. He said he went to paradise and he heard things too sacred to reveal. He's saying, it reminds me of 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. The human heart can't even imagine what God has prepared for them that love him. He's saying it would be a crime to try to use human language to convey what this man saw in paradise. Verse 5, of such a one will I glory, yet not of myself. I will not glory. I'd rather glory in my weaknesses. So you see how Paul's getting pulled into this thing where he has to glory 
He says he feels foolish for doing it. He has to assert the reality that truly he is called of God and the fruit of God is evident in his life. He's defending the ministry and trying not to be defensive, right? But he keeps saying, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather just celebrate my infirmities though. I'd rather just celebrate my infirmities though. He says the same thing um, in 2 Corinthians 11.30 after listing all his sufferings. He says, if I must needs glory, I'd rather glory in the things about my weaknesses. I'd rather talk about my weaknesses. I'd rather talk about how I'm weak and he's strong. Instead of telling you all of the great things that I've done, I'd rather talk about how it really is just me at my weakest point and how I'd rather tell you about my darkest points when I was crying out for him and how he showed up and why he gets all the glory. I'd rather just brag about my weaknesses. So here's, what, here's the reality. That was Paul that went to the third heavens. But do you notice it's so holy that he won't, he's not even comfortable using the first person singular. He's like, I knew a man. I knew a man who went. And as you read the rest of the verses, you could tell it was him, right? Like, look, let's just keep reading. Of such a one, verse five, I will glory. Yet of myself, I will not glory, but rather glory in my weaknesses. For verse six, though I would desire to glory, there's a part of my flesh that wants to glory. I will not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear. I, I'm going to hold back, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears of me. I don't want anyone putting me on any pedestal. And unless, verse 7, I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Look at this. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's how you could tell that even though he's talking about a man who went to heaven, it's him. Because he comes back and says, unless I get a big head about it, the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh. Really what it's saying is, no, no, let's, let's be careful. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. He's saying, Satan was allowed to give me a thorn in the flesh. It says a thorn, but actually it was a, a Bedouin tent stake. It actually was the kind of nail you use when you crucified someone. This is not like a little something from a rose uh, bush, you know, that you get in your finger or even a little shard of glass in your foot. This is an impaling nail that you'd crucify people with or that you would hammer down a large tent with in the rough desert sands. He's saying, lest I should get a big head. He says, for my own protection, right? Because how did Lucifer fall? Pride, Ezekiel 28. He's saying, for my own protection, a thorn in the flesh was given to me so that I wouldn't be destroyed by pride. You see, you should fear your gifts more than you fear your greatest sin. Because see, your greatest sin will just keep you broken. But it's your gifts. It's your gifts. It's your gifts that I have you thinking you could fly higher uh, than the sky. It's your gifts that will make you lust for power. It's your gifts that can destroy you. He says, lest I should get a big head, the enemy was allowed to give me this impaling tent stake, this impaling crucifying nail in my flesh. Ah, he chose this description. He chose this description. Someone might say, I have a splitting headache. Someone might say, I have an excruciating headache. And do you know the word excruciating actually comes from crucifixion? He's saying, there was given to me a crucifying nail in my flesh. Ah, wow. And then you're like, well, I wonder how he felt about it. You could already tell by the language. Verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Look. If you ask me, hey, how many times, um, you know, have you prayed for this, that, or a third? We just don't know, right? But if you say to me, well, think of one of the darkest moments of your life. How many times do you remember those prayers? And I could tell, I, I distinctly remember those prayers. I've gone through things with my own brother, right? My older brother. Some of his darkest moments, some of the scariest points in my life when I was a new believer and he was struggling, right? I remember the prayers. I can remember after he had a very dark episode 
I remember getting on the subway, riding the subway down to Penn's Landing before it was even hooked up, sitting under the Ben Franklin Bridge, even took ash, sprinkled it on my forehead because I was just in mourning and in prayer, just hung my legs over the edge, over the Delaware River, and just wrote a prayer to the Lord. You see, when you're going through really dark moments, you know what I mean? You remember the prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Paul, this is deep because he, he remembers how many times he prayed. Three times I prayed. Who else prayed three times? Jesus in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But interestingly, look at what the Lord says to him. Interesting that Jesus prayed three times in the garden. Father, let this cup pass from me. Father, let this cup pass from me. Father, let this cup pass from me. Did Jesus get the answer to that prayer? Did he get the yes? No, the cup didn't go away. He drank the cup, and it's the cup of God's wrath. He drank the cup of God's wrath in our place. Did you know that it says in the Psalms? Did you know about that cup? It says in the Psalms, and I'm going to give you the verse. I believe it is Psalm, oh boy, you know how it is when I just try to turn to some of them, right? Um, Psalm 75, verse 8. In the hand of Yahweh, there is a cup. The wine is red. It's full of mixture. And he pours out the same, but the dregs thereof, the wicked of the earth, will wring it out and drink it. When Jesus is in the garden, and he's saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. He who knew no sin, becoming our sin, he saw the cup of the Father's wrath that he would have to drink and be separated from the Father, becoming a curse. But it says, for the joy set before him, he endured it. What he saw on the other side was see a sinner like me, a ex-tarot card, a Ouija board user like me, sitting here forgiven and saved. A sinner like my wife, right? Sitting forgiven and saved. You saved. He, he says, the joy, he despised the shame. But he saw the, the joy set before him. He saw redeemed saints as a love gift from the Father who would be saved. Oh, yeah, Jesus loved us unto the uttermost, even unto the end, with an everlasting love. So Jesus prays three times. Paul's praying three times. You know, it says in Philippians, Paul says that he wanted to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. You know, one of the most beautiful things the Lord can give us is moments where we actually are overlapping with the experiences of our Lord when he walked the earth. It's one of the most beautiful things he can give you. Did you ever read that in Philippians 3? Paul lists his resume in Philippians. He lists his resume. And then he says, but my whole resume, I count it as dung. I count it as animal feces. Why? For the excellency of knowing Jesus. He's saying the excellency of just knowing Jesus and being his outshines all of my biggest exploits and my biggest resume uh, in what I worked for all of my life. And he says, this is what I do. I want to be found in him, Philippians 3 verse 9. And then he says this, and I want to know him. Here's a born again believer. And what's he saying? I just want to know him. And then he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. You see, one of the most beautiful things the Lord can give us is times where we have to endure pain on earth, but it actually is identical with what the Lord endured for righteousness. Not enduring pain because we're being knuckleheads. Not it says in Peter, let no man suffer because he's being unrighteous, right? Don't, 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 don't claim to be a martyr when you're when you're dealing with drama that you created because you were a knucklehead. No, it's talking about when we're trying to fight the good fight of faith to the best that we can, and the Lord allows us to experience things in ministry, in the Christian walk, among family and whomever, and you find that your life is identical with the betrayal of Christ. Your life is identical with the betrayal of Joseph. Your life is identical with all of how people turned on Daniel. It's one of the most beautiful things he could do is to bring your life in line with the sufferings of Christ because it you find a fellowship there. It's the fellowship of his sufferings. A lot of believers don't do that. So what do they do? They just endure the trial and they come out bitter people. You know what? Look, it can happen to any one of us, but I today I'm saying a special prayer for bitter Christians. You got to give that up. You got to realize that you're bitter because you don't know the, you don't apply, you don't, you've not been walking in biblical wisdom. 
You're bitter because of your Christian experiences. You're bitter because of your church hurt because you have a lot of Bible knowledge, but you don't have a lot of Bible wisdom, meaning you don't know how to apply the Bible to when the stuff happens to where you're like, oh, snap. Yo, Paul wanted to know the fellowship of his sufferings, one of the most beautiful things the Lord could do. And it's not just the fellowship of his sufferings because the Lord doesn't want us just to know pain, 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 pain. It's also the power of his resurrection so that we would know the glory of being close, super close with our Jesus in how he went so low, but in how he was exalted and went so high. We get to know both. Ah, hallelujah. So look, this 25 minutes. I got to make some decisions here, but let's keep it moving. Paul is the one who went to heaven. Notice he keeps saying in 2 Corinthians 12, whether I was in the body, I don't know. Whether I was out of the body, I don't know. God knows. It's like, what's going on here? Well, if you know your scriptures, then you would turn to Acts 14. Acts 14, verses 19 through 22. This is what happened. And this is what most people believe, that this is when it happened. Mind you, when did he say this happened? Paul's writing 2 Corinthians 12. Follow me now. Follow me, please. Paul's writing 2 Corinthians 12. He's saying in verse 2, I knew a man 14 years ago. He says, let me tell you about what happened 14 years ago. Most people believe. And then he says, by the way, whether I was dead, whether this man, quote unquote, was dead. Let's read it again. I knew a man in Christ about, look, 2 Corinthians 12 too. I'm excited. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I can't tell, or whether out of the body, I can't tell. God knows. Then he says it again. Verse 3, I knew such a man. Whether in the body, I can't tell. Whether out of the body, I can't tell. God knows. What's he talking about? Sounds like someone who had a near-death experience and they don't even know whether they were dead and, and literally went to heaven or whether they were just in a coma and the Lord showed up and showed him the vision. That's why he keeps saying God knows. Most people believe that that's Acts 14. Turn to Acts 14, verses 19 through 22. Paul went and preached at Lystra. They started worshiping Paul like he was a Greek god. The minute he said, no, I'm not a god, I'm a man just like you. But let me tell you about Jesus. Yo, they went from thinking he was a god to what happened in Acts 14, 19. Then there came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And what they do? They stoned Paul, dragged him out the city, and what supposed he'd been dead? They left him there for dead. This is when Paul is saying, I was that man. I went to the third heavens. I don't know whether I really went and came back to life like Lazarus or whether I was in a coma and just saw the vision. God knows. That's when it was right there. I, I, I'm, I'm, that's my go-to. There's a lot. Really, that's the prevailing view among all theologians and students of scripture. And then it says, basically, they left him there like he'd been dead. However, as the disciples stood around about him, they thought he was dead. It said, boom, verse 20, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas and Derby. See, a lot of people would have just got up and gone home. They'd have got, yo, people quit off of infinitely less. People quit when, when, when someone, I don't know, just, just doesn't tell them in enough time that there's a change in the Sunday school program. When they just when when they show up and what they thought they were going to do for the night they didn't get to do for the night and when they don't get the microphone as soon as they wanted, Paul got stoned. What's he do? Got up and what did he do? When they had preached the gospel to that city and taught many, he returned to Lystra. What did he do? He got shot up by the firing squad, dragged out the city. Where's he go when he resurrects off the ground? Back to the same spot. Back to the same city. Yo, listen to this. And what did he do? Verse 22. He confirmed the souls of the disciples and he exhorted them to continue in the faith and said that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Yo, can you imagine how this dude looked? It said he went back and he had a message for them at Lystra. He got stoned and dragged out the city. I personally believe he died. The Lord is so glorified. I believe Jonah died in the whale and was resurrected. I believe Paul died. Paul doesn't even know if he died. I'm, I would not be surprised if he died. The disciples thought he was dead when he rose up. Imagine how he looks when he goes back in the city. And he's just scarred up, stoned up. 
I mean, swirled up. And what does it look like when he looks at the Saints and Lister and they're like, yo, you're back. And he's like, yo, let me tell you something. Continue in the faith. Yo, he didn't have to say it. His life said it. See? And then he said this. We must, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Yo, he, who does he look like right here? He looks just like Jesus. John 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You see, look, I could end up with a trial later on today. And if I don't apply this at that moment, I could fall to pieces like a house of cards. We got to remember this. We got to cherish it. We got to fall in love with it. Are you falling in love with this today? Boom. Back to 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, you look, it was so special what Paul was showing about heaven. He keeps saying, I knew a man. I knew a man 14 years ago. I knew a man 14 years ago. But then he says this, lest I should get a big head, verse 7, through the abundance of the revelations. Oh, I would say going to heaven and being shown paradise. Can you imagine what it'd be like to live the rest of your Christian life when you're done seeing paradise? You think you'd, be, you think you'd struggle with holding on to $20 in the face of a homeless person? You think you'd struggle with being stingy? You think you, you see what I'm saying? Wow, to see glory? You think you'd be as easily tempted to start wanting to build your kingdom down here when you're done seeing it? He says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He says, there was a, a ministry. While I was doing ministry, there was a ministry that was given to me, the ministry of the thorn, the ministry of the crucifying nail in my flesh. That nail had a ministry. Do you know that there's some things we're going through that have a ministry? Your depression could have a ministry. Your anxiety could have a ministry. A ministry to do what? To keep us from being exalted and being puffed up. The Lord knows just how much to give us and to keep us close and get us closer to the Lord and understand what? Let's read. He says, for this thing, verse 8, I besought the Lord three times that he might take it from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, he came to realize the thorn had a purpose and that the thorn came with provision of, of knowing grace more. What are you going through today? What is your thorn? Paul, it never got taken away from him. That means for four, he said he knew a man 14 years ago and the thorn was given lest he should be puffed up from what he saw 14 years ago. Paul is writing 14 years of carrying that thing. What was it? Some think the thorn in the flesh was an eye condition. I don't think it was an eye condition. Galatians 6, 11, he says, look at the letter I've written. He had to write a letter with large letters when he wrote to Galatians because he did have an affliction of the eyes, a.k.a. ophthalmia. I don't think it was that because the Lord says my grace is sufficient. I believe it was something in Paul's mind. It was a way the enemy was attacking his thinking. I got to go. I got to go. Tomorrow we'll be back. We're going to talk about the ministry of the thorn. God bless you. Be encouraged in the word. Read ahead. Salute.